So we're going to start out with uh, item two, which is public comment, and uh, public comment will be two minutes for each speaker, starting with Melissa Diner. today to talk about the Westminster People Street Plaza. So essentially West Westminster between Speedway and Pacific is going to be become a hard closed street. There'll be a gate put up. Hi. Okay. Um, and on either side, four feet and four feet, we're gonna have vignettes with tables, chairs, and umbrellas. This has been a four year in the process um, to, to actually come to fruition. The ultimate goal is to replicate this once we're successful on Westminster on other streets that fire will allow for hard street closures um, to create more of a uh, community gathering space to beautify the street. And originally this idea was born from when the person drove onto the boardwalk. The city came together with about 20 different agencies to figure out how we could secure the streets to prevent people from coming to be able to drive straight onto the boardwalk um, while beautifying the area. And from community members, I've just volunteered my time to bring all the agencies together to support us. So it's getting implemented this summer. Um, I'm just in like a check in the egg situation with um, LA DOT as to like whether they're going to install um, the graphics that you see here that will be painted on the street um, before or after the furniture is ordered. So originally the date was going to be June 30th, now we're looking more at August. So I'm basically here to just ask for a letter of support from the bid. Um, when we started this project, the bid didn't exist. And so now you guys are maintaining that area of the street already. So we had to submit a bid, a budget of costs and expenses. So I would just like a letter from you guys saying that but since this project started, the bid has been created and we will continue to support with our regular maintenance routine on this street um, because I think that will just help show them that we have additional support that we didn't have. Um, and then uh, we're about to purchase the furniture. So I just let's finished. Take, let's take another, yeah. take, take another minute or two. Yeah, uh, yeah. The, the next point is we're about to purchase all the furniture. So I would love, I think it would be a great project for you guys to make a financial contribution to. I think it's aligned with everything the bid stands for. So I'll send you guys a pledge of what the furniture is going to cost and any contribution that you guys can make as an organization or any individual that you guys, or as an individual, if you guys want to help offset that cost, that'd be great. We're also going to ask all the businesses and the property owners adjacent to have committed financially to support this and to store the furniture and to help maintain the area daily. So it won't be all on you guys. This is a group. 
Um, and then ultimately, you guys also didn't exist when you started as a beneficiary. So the chambers are beneficiary right now, but down the line as we see things go, it may make more sense for us to work together on this in terms of insurance. Um, and if we get into like replicating this model once we're successful later. Thank you. Yeah. And, and thanks for your volunteer efforts in yeah, the community yeah, and on this yeah. project. I know it's taken a, a lot of time. Yes, and, uh, I'm so proud to be a part of it and just to see it come alive. Thank you very much. Yeah. Okay. And I'll provide a little bit of feedback later on in my report. Okay, great. Further down the agenda. Thank you. Uh, Emily Winters, welcome. for all the help in um, uh, getting our, we're going to refurbish the mural, uh, David Peters mural on Park Avenue. I'm Emily Winters, the artist that designed it. And uh, it's been, it was painted originally in 1990. So, uh, especially Connie Brooks for uh, helping us get, uh, working with the homeless, and Paul Williams is going to uh, sandblast the sidewalk on Monday morning, I mean Sunday morning, to get it ready for the, for the workers to start the program. So I will hope we don't in a few days. So I just want to thank them for their support and help in getting this project going. Thank you for the beautiful art you've supplied. <laughs> You're very welcome. <laughs> thank you. And your commitment to well, doing also, it. Yeah. The, the funding that we received to do this is a mainly a generous uh, donation from the Sharp Family Foundation and uh, from the residents of Park Avenue. They're very supportive of the mural and they're very watchful. They call me up or email me when there's a tag. So, so, so it's a good community project that seems to have a good effect on the, on the neighborhood and that's what it's supposed to do. Thank you very much. Emily, thank you. you had, uh, thanks for your years of, of dedication to the arts here. That yes. Oh, you're very welcome. Thank, thank you. you for helping. Uh, Suzanne Thompson. Good morning. Good morning. Um, I also just want to comment on behalf of the Venice Arts Council and the Beijing Arts Fund, the, uh, all the community on Park Avenue and the Bernard Schaefer Foundation and Mr. Weinstein here with your support for the building and, and cooperation with electricity and water. So we'll be out there Monday and Viz is going to be there Sunday cleaning the sidewalk for us. And then Monday and Tuesday, we hope to get the work done. I'll be there talking to the community so Emily and her daughter can paint and Social Public Art Resource Center, which is Spark, is going to be doing the restoration. And uh, hopefully it won't take more than two days and they're also going to use uh, proper uh, business practices and collecting the water and the chipped paint that's coming off the wall. So it's really important to save our public art in Venice. We're gonna lose the mural on Main and, and uh, Market. Um, Esther cannot keep it maintained anymore. And um, I believe she's notified the um, original artist who has, doesn't exist, but the family's still around. So um, we hope to be able to get the graffiti off sooner. It's been a long process. Uh, because of glitches within some of the organization's turnovers, but we're happy to do it, and thank you for your support. And after this is cleaned, hopefully, um, Bid will be able to make sure that it's nice and pretty. <laughs> and the protective coating is going on for sure, right? Yes. 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 I want to add one more thing. I want to thank Jeremy Weinstein for all his support. Thank you, Jeremy. All of thank the you. years, he's just been very, very helpful in helping us get keep that mural going. Thank you. Thank you to the patrons of the arts and murals of Venice. Uh, John O'Kulik, welcome, John. Yes, I um, have a few questions for you. You probably won't answer. But, uh, <laughs> I've requested a number of times uh, California Public Records Act uh, request for information from your group, from Carter Hind especially. She has never given me any information. Keeps telling me she'll get it to me uh, in two or three months. That hasn't happened. I'd also like to know where, why $131,000 was paid to the Venice Boardwalk Association. And I'd like to know how many of you were on that, uh, in that association. Could you raise your hand if you were part of the Venice Boardwalk Association? 
and if you were on that. Uh, the other thing is that uh, your uh, cleaning guys were over there the other day and uh, using herbicides to kill the grass. Um, you know, herbicides are carcinogenic. Uh, it's disgusting to see them do that. I also know that their power washing is, is pushing the uh, feces and the rest of the crap uh, into the uh, sewers that goes out into the ocean. I also heard that one of the cleaning people mentioned that they're, they're not going within 100 feet of the uh, encampments to clean. So that sort of negates your whole position here as uh, a cleaning, <coughs> cleaning the streets, especially around the encampments. I uh, also like to know if Universal uh, Security has any uh, affiliation with organized crime. Uh, and that's, that's what I have to say. I think all of you have, um, are disgusting. This is this whole thing. I'd like to be out of it. Uh, you know, it's a, just another form of extortion. Okay, thank you, John. Uh, the next uh, public comment. People of California, welcome people of California. Thank you. Uh, I was looking at your bylaws and it says that you're supposed to be elected once a year. It's supposed to be elections and it occurs to me that that hasn't occurred. Therefore, you guys would be sitting here in an ultra virus capacity uh, in violation of your bylaws. I noticed there was a letter from Margaret Malloy uh, raising issues and I would like to ask that that be included in the record. Um, also, uh, I was hearing uh, about Westminster Avenue being turned into a, a outdoor dining area, it sounds like. Uh, this seems to be like a, a recurring pattern where uh, crimes are occurred, uh, occur in Venice, committed by business owners, uh, whether they're turning residential uh, RSO uh, units into <coughs> hotel rooms for the highest bidder, or um, we're taking public space and turning it into private space without permitting, and that's been the case on Westminster. And now it seems like the city's just gonna go and do whatever it has to to uh, make the crime not a crime anymore. So that seems to be a real problem, and uh, I wonder how, uh, considering that this board is affiliated with people like Carl Lambert and Lambert Properties, which is doing that, other property owners that were doing illegal things, how this board is not also violating the city charter because it's supposed to follow the city rules. Thank you. Okay, uh, the last public comment is uh, Michael Angelo. Welcome, Michael. Oh, hi. Um, yes, I have uh, an office on Wayscrest Wave Crest Avenue, and there's the Starry Night mural from Kronk under there. It's been there forever. You probably know that it got completely tagged by this group. And I noticed that they, this group, I believe they're doing giant tags all around the neighborhood. I, I saw them late one night and I'm just trying to figure out what to do because when you call the police, you sit on hold. And what happened when the actual muralists were there and they were doing the On Starry Night, and you maybe already know all this, but my, my neighbor, Italian woman, she saw it. She told them to stop, they wouldn't stop. Even the homeless people in the, in the alley asked them to stop. She called the police, was on hold. While she was on hold, they tagged her car. Now, uh, it's hearsay, but from the, the encampments that the, one of the gentlemen had a gun, so it was they decided not to mess with them. I, don't, I can't confirm that. But my point is, uh, I would love to have some suggestions because I'm a lot in the neighborhood. You guys all know I'm making a documentary about Venice. And I just would want to be able to like stop this because the, these murals are so beautiful. Obviously, it's a great cost. And so if there's any advice on how to deal with that, I would love if that came up in the meeting, so. Thank you, Michael. Okay, so that closes the public comment. Uh, next is item three. Welcome to our government representatives. First is Taylor Basley from Mike Bonica. Welcome, Taylor. Hey, friends. Um, I, I, I'll just address that real quick, actually. So. Um, Definitely call 911 if it's a crime in progress. And if that's the number that they called and they got uh, switched over to the um, non-emergency number, um, then please let me know about that. We, uh, the LAPD hasn't always uh, used their investigative resources for um, uh, uh, mur destruction of mural, and that's something that we're trying to make a higher priority to them. Um, 
credit to Emily Winters and Suzanne for when, when their mural got destroyed, um, going and doing kind of uh, uh, the work to file an official police report. Um, we need a police report to start uh, a, a, an investigation. Makes sense, you need to have a victim in order to be able to uh, look for a crime. And usually these murals, um, there's no police report filed. I, I think this might've been like one, one of the first instances of a police report actually being filed. So we need that in order to do the investigation. So I'm trying to get out there to folks that if that happens, we need a police report. If not for your specific crime, because for a lot of property owners, it's easier to just re repaint it and coat it and get on with it. But for the investigative process so that we can actually have detectives look at who is doing this, catch them and put them in jail um, so they don't, so, uh, so that they are deterred from doing it in the future. Um, so there's that. Um, on, a, on, a, on a maybe happier note, uh, I've got lots of stuff to talk about on Ocean Front Walk. So there is, in the bid boundaries, lots of good stuff happening. I'm sure many of you have seen it already happen or happening, uh, or maybe know of some of the stuff that will be happening, but um, uh, going kind of from south to the north, uh, many of you have seen that Muscle Beach is under full renovation. That's really exciting, one of our uh, biggest uh, tourist uh, attractions and also just community resources. Uh, Muscle Beach has been in a completely dilapidated state. Uh, the, 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 the maps were bad, the, all the equipment was rusty, the paint was bad. It was, I, I, got, I got pictures all the time of people ashamed of, of the, the current state of Muscle Beach compared to what it used to be. Well, I'm really glad that Record Parks is, is, is engaging in this four month entire renovation. So the, the, the door there is gonna be fixed, the mats, all new equipment, everything's getting redone. So it is, that is gonna be a huge benefit. Combined with the paddle tennis course that also just got a complete facelift only a year ago or so, that whole area and the basketball courts, that whole recreation area I think is gonna be um, really great. So that's something that I think I'm uh, particularly excited about. Also, y'all might have noticed that this project is already completed, that the vendor spaces were all remarked and in some, uh, uh, some situations moved a little bit. Um, that seemed like a really small thing, but it, it, was, it was a lot more work on the back end, especially for Rec and Parks, because the number of spots is codified into LA Municipal Code, uh, and even what type of spots there are, because there's some performer spots and, and, and some other ones. They're mostly vendors, but there, there's a few other spots. Um, so a lot of credit goes out to Rec and Parks for um, re moving some of the spots into places that it makes more sense now, because the last time that they were set was I don't know, 20 years ago or something, and, and the built environment has changed to some extent. And, um, but the, but the, the redoing of the spots and the remarking of it, I've already seen when I walk down Ocean for a walk, how vendors now feel more compelled to stay in the discrete boundaries instead of uh, take up multiple spots. So hopefully that creates a little bit greater supply for vendors and we have greater diversity of vendors and art, artists are actually able to utilize those spots and it's a little bit greater um, um, order there and enforceability for LAPD as people are kind of taking multiple spots which they're not supposed to. Uh, so that was cool. Um, on the horizon, I don't think they've started this yet, um, although we should have the palm trees. Have they been getting trimmed yet? There's, okay, so I guess not, but there's like 800, <laughs> yeah, uh, but there's like 850 palm trees on Venice Beach. Wow, way more than I expected. I thought it'd be like 150 or something like that. No, there's like 850, OMG. Um, but <laughs> Wreck-It Parks, uh, I, I, I thought they were, uh, they were gonna have started like last week. I'll just check in, but that's something you can look forward to is they're, they're trimming all the palm trees. Uh, this is a sort of like annual rite of passage that the new superintendent has started to undergo. Before it'd take, you know, we, we, they'd get trimmed like every couple of years, now, now we're doing it annually. But that's kind of a, a big thing, I think, of grooming all the trees. Um, so that's kind of cool. So we've got the vendor spaces, Muscle Beach, the trees. That's, I think, a, a, a good amount of investment into Ocean Front Walk. But there's actually more. Um, the, um, uh, Tara asked me to uh, mention the anti-vehicle baller protection system and where that's at. This is a project that I'm personally extremely excited about. Uh, Melissa had kind of uh, 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 previewed a little piece of it. Um, way back when, when the person got uh, person uh, drove over some people on Ocean Front Walk, the uh, uh, the city looked at how we can um, better secure Ocean Front Walk. That resulted in two recommendations: the camera system, which we have and is great and super useful. It also <laughs> resulted in this uh, anti-vehicle system, which makes more sense because the, the actual 
crime they're responding to was vehicles illegally entering Oceanfront Walk. Uh, that anti-vehicle protection system, though, was a little bit more expensive, a little bit more difficult, and, and kind of got gummed up for years. But over the last year or so, we've completely figured it out. It's looking great. And in this last, uh, um, uh, in just uh, a couple months ago, we've secured the funding, to for the full funding, in this next fiscal year budget. So actually more funding than I even asked for, So which is great, because I asked for enough funding for all the bells and whistles, um, and we're, we're even getting above that. So it's going to be uh, it's going to be a great project. We're able to start spending the money July one. When we're actually going to start doing the project is a little a little question, but hopefully not soon, far after July one. The only thing I have to figure out is how we um, how we appropriate the funds to the to the contractor. It's just it's a bureaucratic um, back end thing. Uh, but the contractor says the construction is only going to take like a month or less and they're kind of ready to start right away. And that's gonna be really great because up and down from um, South Venice Boulevard all the way to the Santa Monica line, there's going to be uh, bollards, uh, the uniform. So instead of the blue bikes here and the signs there and the K rails over there and that thing on that one street that's like a metal thing that goes yeah. up like that and, and, and other devices, we've got plastic bollards, we've got armadillos, that's the thing that's on 17th, that's kind of like the speed hump, it, just like, all these different anti-vehicle systems, that's all gonna be taken out and replaced with um, bollards that are, that, that are more effective, actually do the job, instead of like a blue bike that could really honestly be rammed through, and um, are, are more consistent and, 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 and seamly. And we've, uh, most of them will be st uh, fixed, so they won't be able to be moved, they're just gonna be there, but at um, eight strategic points, they're gonna be retractable. Those are 10 times more expensive, which is why it's not at all of them and we had to limit it. But um, it, it's pretty strategic points up and down um, Ocean Park, the major streets. If, if you all had to guess what some of those streets were, you'd probably guess right about most of them. 17th and, um, and Windward itself. Windward actually we have some ones that could be removed. So if ever we need to get something really massive through, that's where it's gonna go through. And then, um, um, and some on Oceanfront Walk, but the one at Rose in Venice where the vehicles go over into the parking lot. But the ones on Oceanfront Walks will have little lights on them and stuff, um, which I thought was a nice little feature. Yeah. So, yeah, it's cool, right? Yeah, no, it's cool. Like, I know it was a lot of talking. Because I but... almost rolled my bike over the plastic ones a couple of times, so a light would help. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's going to be all lit. It's going to be looking great. I am super excited about that. I think it's going to, like I said, just not look great, which it will, but it's also going to be functionally a huge improvement. Like, vehicles won't be able to drive on oceanfront walk. <laughs> That's great. Um, and we won't have the K-rails and stuff, which uh, some people don't like. So you're not interested in the uh, homeless problem, the 16% increase. Is that well, cool too? Well, I, that's that's not cool, but um, mm -hmm. I'm talking about the vehicles, the anti-vehicle yeah, right. all our protection. Mm -hmm. So um, that I think is maybe about it. I'm excited about some of the stuff we're doing around art. Um, and to, I, I've just contracted with a uh, artist to, to redo eight of the utility boxes. I think most of them are actually in the bit boundaries. And any utility boxes we do now, we coat in protective coating that we get from Spark. That's, that's something that I don't know why that wasn't the mainstay of Venice up until a couple of years ago, but moving forward, if just any art that we want protected needs to have yeah. some sort of coating on it. Um, we all know that already, but we're, taking, we're, we're internalizing that with our electrical boxes. Um, and that is all I can think of, so great. And can yes, I just scarring. say that to your point about the scouring night, um, we are, we're working with Taylor to get some of those older murals retro-coated with the protective coating, and he's been really helpful in ways that we can get that done so that if there are taggers, we can now get the graffiti off mm -hmm. much more quickly and much more easily. So mm -hmm. that's in process, it's just yes. a little slow. Any property owner that has a mural on it, if they can just get me the, the this release form that says, I'm the property owner and it's cool for you to come on, uh, come on to my property, and put protective coating on this mural. Uh, if I can get that, I can get the city to coat at least most of it. There is a limit on square feet, but. Um, I think that only goes up to nine feet, right? Because that's. Well, yeah, yeah, it only goes up to eight, I think. Eight. Uh, yeah, because we assume that people aren't gonna bring a ladder to, which might be a, a faulty assumption, but. Um, yeah. 
In fact, I'm sure it is a faulty assumption, but <laughs> and at least deters most uh, graffiti. All and, and you reminded me because uh, if I haven't talked enough, I did just want to shout out to Melissa again about Westminster. I think it's a super cool project. She's engaging in uh, LA DOT has a People Street project, as she kept uh, as she noted, and they they, they uh, well she already said it, but I'll just say it again because it's so exciting and she really has all the credit for it. It, 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 it takes a street that otherwise isn't used for anything. It, you can't go on Oceanfront Walk there. There's not parking spots there even. It's just, it's just kind of a dead street. And it turns it into a little plaza for the public use that everyone will be able to use and, it, it, and, and, and adds a little bit of life to otherwise a vehicular street which people aren't even supposed to be on. So it, it, it repurposes it for pedestrian use in, in a way that I think is pretty exciting. So a lot of credit goes to Melissa for keeping that foot, uh, keep pushing that football down the down the, it's been years, <laughs> but it's, it's, it's finally on the horizon, so. All right, that's all we've got. Yes. Hey, hey, hey. Okay, to fund the bridge housing activities. Oh, yes, okay, so bridge housing, I mean, we're hoping for a November open date. Um, so uh, the activity you see now is about putting in the sewer, the water, and the electrical. Obviously, that's the first thing you would you would need to do. Um, it, it, um, well, act, we're actually hoping for an October date, I should have said. So that, that's, that's the date we're really shooting for. Uh, I said my pessimistic date that isn't supposed to come out of my mouth. Uh, October. <laughs> the October. Um, it, so it's sewer, electrical, water. Um, on top of that, then you'll start to see the trailers, the spruce structure. Um, we've figured out who the, uh, so all, all the kind of back end details are done, a site plan, the budget for it who the actual service provider is going to be. It's going to be uh, PATH. Um, that's great. PATH is super reputable. They, um, they've done work in Venice before. We've contracted with them before. Everyone has great things to say about them. Uh, don't know what else to say about PATH other than everyone seems to like them. Uh, and they're great. So they're going to be the service provider there. Oh, and subcontracting with SPY for the youth component. Because there's 100 adult beds and then there's 54 youth beds. Those 54 youth beds, the services will be done through SPY, since SPY is the CES lead for the entire service planning area. It goes all the way to Hollywood. They're, they're, they're kind of the, the main youth organization, not just here, but kind of in the region. Um, so they're gonna be doing the youth services. PATH will be doing the adult services. I'm hoping for an October date. What else do I have to say about that? Um, we've got, I guess I've just previewed, one thing I'm really excited about Bridge Home is we've got a lot of really great partners. Shout out to like UCLA Dental, that's gonna, that, that's gonna be doing dental. We've shout out to uh, Venice Family Clinic, that's, uh, that's really going above and beyond to help offer some um, health services. Um, Chrysalis, who's going to basically be offering a job to anybody who wants it from, from the Bridge Home. Um, so there's a lot of programmatic partners that are going into this that isn't just PATH, SPY, and, and the city. Um, it's going to be kind of a lot of additional things only for the program participants who live there. I should make sure to note that. It's not for folks outside, outside of the program. It's for inside the program that they'll have access to hygiene and haircuts and, 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 and job opportunities. Um, and that's kind, of, that's kind of all set up and ready to go. So once we open October, uh, it will... <laughs> October, uh, it will... Um, going to be, I think, a huge, huge, huge improvement. And with that obviously comes the um, enhanced outreach area and also an enhanced um, uh, sanitation area. So that way, areas that have become uh, clean from uh, encampments because those unhoused have moved into this interim housing remain clean. So it's going to be an improvement for the neighborhood and for the folks living on the streets. It's going to be Do you live in the neighborhood? I do, I do. 55 North Center. That's not the neighborhood where the MTA is. That's like three quarters of a mile. But um, okay, so that's my uh, update. Thank you, Taylor. Thank you, Taylor. I want to take a minute just to say thank you to Taylor. He's been a really consistent presence at our meetings, and I think I speak for most people in this community when I say that he is remarkably accessible, informative, and keeps it real in a really refreshing way about what can and can't be done and how it can and can't. So I personally appreciate that and really enjoy working with you. So thank you. Thank you, Taylor. Thank you. Next government representative, uh, 
Zachary Geitzik from Supervisor Sheila Fuel's office. Welcome, Hello, Zachary. Hello, everyone. Um, don't mind, I'll stand over here. So I hope to be as accessible and wonderful to work with as Taylor has set the bar. <laughs> Thank you for putting me after him. Um, <laughs> so I just wanted to come down here. Um, I'm here on behalf of LA County Supervisor Sheila Kuehl, who is the uh, supervisor for the third district. For those that don't know, the third district goes from down here in Venice all the way up to Pacoima. Uh, East to Calabasas, or sorry, west to Calabasas, and then east all the way to Universal Studios at Water Village Los Feliz. It's about 434 square miles and covers about 2.5 million individuals. Uh, and so I am the field representative for the Venice neighborhood, uh, Santa Monica, Pacific Palisades, West LA, and West Hollywood. And sort of one of the things that the supervisor has really been pushing uh, with the field representatives and making sure that they are at all the community meetings such as this one to make sure that uh, we are as accessible as possible. A lot of people don't necessarily know what the county does. They know it's a geographic area. LA County is the largest one in the United States, covering 10.5 million people and around 4,000 square miles. But they don't necessarily realize that we are the primary social service agency. Um, we provide all of the state programs like Medi-Cal, like food stamps. Um, we do a significant amount of what we refer to as contract work. So for instance, we run the beaches and harbors, we contract with LA City for that. Uh, we do the sheriffs, we do LA County Fire Department, uh, we do the lifeguards, and a number of other different things, covering about 38 departments, um, and a yearly budget of like roughly three, $34 billion a year. And so what we always like to do is just sort of let people know, hey, if you need additional resources that might not be covered by the city, though the city does a great job, uh, you can come to check out what the county has to offer because we have a number of different resources for businesses. We have called our Department of Consumer Business Affairs that can really help guide a, a number of different things. We also have our public health department when it comes to restaurants and other things. And we always want to make sure that people know that in case they need any county-related resource, uh, they can just call us. We have, you know, I have a phone, I pick it up on the second ring as often as I can, and we really want to recommend people, instead of coming to us last, um, which is often the case, you can always come to us first. Uh, we have what we refer to as casework, where you call our office because you're having some issue with, say, your Medi-Cal, um, or CalFresh, or you need a birth certificate, or there's something wrong with your property taxes. Uh, you can call us, we'll take down your information, we connect that to our liaisons, and then the department will call you. Shocking, I know. Uh, and then they'll help hopefully be able to resolve that within a few days. Um, I can't tell you how many times people have called saying they're super frustrated, they've been working on something for a month, they make one phone call to us and we're able to resolve it, usually within a day or two. So we always want to recommend people to do that. I'm going to make sure I put a stack of my cards at the front table, uh, just let people know, and that's what I'm here for. Yeah, let me know if you have any questions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. If we know next time that you're coming about mm, five to seven days before, we'll actually agendize you and put you on the agenda as well. So well this I, time I think I'm going to be coming a little bit more regularly. Okay. So. Awesome. Thank you. Thank welcome. you. Taylor makes sure to take some of his business cards because he says they like to be the first resource. Okay. Uh, all right, let's move on to item four reports. Uh, the first is the Venice Beach bid safe team report. Ms. Vella. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Vella. Well, good morning. You know, it's always nice to be back. It's been a while. So we've just celebrated our first year and I'm really excited. Um, I have probably the original team that we started. I mean, I've had a few, you know, turnovers, but for the most part, I still have the same team. So I'm excited about that. Um, I don't know if you've noticed, but it's getting a little warm and we've had quite a few, you know, incidents with that heat. You know, we've, the businesses are, are being impacted and our unhoused community members are being impacted. Um, we've actually had a significant rise of calls for medical emergencies in that time frame that we were seeing the 90 and above degree weather. So I anticipate that being the case if it continues to, you know, get this hot. Um, actually, we had a situation where um, luckily we were there at the when finished the park. We had a, you know, a, a female who was actually on her own and was seizing. Nobody was around. 
our safety team member was doing their patrol. They actually caught that, stopped. The person had been seizing for quite some time. Um, from the time that we clocked it, it was like an additional two more minutes. 911 was called. They stayed with the, with the female um, and they did take her. We did get a follow up and she had been admitted and we don't know the outcome of that, but definitely it was important that we were there. So we definitely are starting to see it make a difference. Um, I don't know if you all take a look at the newsletter that is put out by the bid, which is always great um, if you get a chance to click on it and kind of read through it. Um, but we had, we had some significant um, impactful things that we've done recently. Um, I guess the one that everybody, I mean, we don't like the, um, we like the outcome, we just don't like the process or what happened, but we had that little puppy incident um, that turned nasty quickly. and. Fortunately, we did have an off-duty um, safety team member who contacted the safety team, and they responded and quickly and um, de-escalated the situation as quickly as possible. 911 had been dispatched. That puppy was saved and taken to the animal shelter, and um, that person was investigated and I think is being criminally prosecuted, I would speak. So we, we're definitely starting to see how we're engaging. We've made positive changes in relations with LAPD. We have seen a in quick increase in response from them. And we call them for emergent things and even for you know, things such as health, or health and welfare checks. So we're starting to build a relationship, one that we, we set out to do from the beginning. I think we're there. Um, we continue to get compliance from encampments such as the canals, we're doing really well at lot 731 and lot 701. So we're, we're holding our own at this point. Um, we're getting a lot of city support. You know, we're getting support um, from LAPD and um, the relationship building is definitely working to our advantage. Um, I wanted to address the tagger situation. So we were aware of that situation. Um, and just like, you know, Michelangelo said, there is speculation that there was um, weapons involved. Um, we cannot, you know, assert if that's true or not. <clears throat> LAPD has been informed. They're actually, you know, been on it. Um, and we recommend, we highly recommend, just like Taylor said, to please continue to report that. Because we actually had video footage of it. We turned it over to LAPD. LAPD did the report. They, do, they did their due diligence and the business owner did not want to file a report. So we really do need to emphasize that that's really important. We are out there, we're trying to do our part. We are getting people to cooperate with us and in turn, we're able to turn in some of that evidence to LAPD. Um, let's see, and I think, um, and I think that's it. I think I, I you know, um, I'm excited. We definitely have gotten an increased volume of calls. We have successfully been able to um, respond to this calls rather quickly. And um, so just keep calling, keep calling us and we'll keep coming out there and we'll investigate the situation, the situation and assess it and see how we can, we can improve ourselves. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And, uh, and also please, please thank the people in the field too. We appreciate all their efforts. Thank you. thank you very much. I, I want to just note briefly as well that one of the things, um, we've now had a number of incidents that have occurred over the last year that have actually gone to court and I want to say that one of, I think, the very important um, roles that we value for our safety members is that when our safety members are involved in those incidents, um, they cooperate with the police department, they provide reports of what they saw, what they experienced, and then if we are, um, uh, we also uh, indicate that we are willing to go to court and our folks have been called and testified in a number of cases that resulted in some very violent people in our community either um, making a plea deal or being uh, sentenced. So that is one of those things, it is always a complex issue, but an enormous number of people um, for a variety of reasons do not want to file a police report or do not want to be called to testify if something goes to trial. And unfortunately our justice system is heavily dependent upon people who will. So I want to applaud, we have quite a number of our safety members who have now testified in court in response to incidents that we've been involved in. So. That's great. And thank you, thank you, Austin, for uh, thank you for for all your leadership and uh, the excellent training and guidance you provide for the team. We really appreciate it. Okay, item four uh, B, the Venice Beach bid clean team report. Ms. Polokov and Mr. Williams, welcome. <laughs> Thank you.
I'll be quick because I know who you want to hear from. So, <laughs> um, so in the month of May, just to share some highlights, um, we maintained and took care of 525 graffiti tags, picked up 666 bulk items, and um, upped our pressure washing to 84 hours with the changing of weather. Um, and you'll continue to see that. I think of special note is that we are doing some targeting of pressure washing throughout the district. So hopefully you will see the um, results of that very shortly. Um, and also of note is that the majority of our crew is now actually Venice community members. So that is really great and exciting. <laughs> Yeah, and just uh, further on that note, uh, most of the ones that are from the Venice community area have seen people that they know or seen our workers or approached us uh, out on the street and inquired, you know, what kind of process this is. We direct them to Chrysalis, you know, they go through all of the procedures, go through all of the training and uh, get the job. And that's what we are created for. That's our priority is people coming from the Santa Monica office and predominantly this area. Uh, it's definitely making an impact. I get to see it every day. I get to see it firsthand uh, on a level that most of you will never see in my interactions with these people. The pride, you know, the relief, you know, and, and just the general positive attitude that they're getting because they, you know, didn't think they'd be able to find something that would allow them to work and not have an address, not have a home, not have any stability. So I'm real happy on that. Uh, the last couple of weeks, we've been making an adjustment from the kind of slow winter wet season. Summertime is here, the weather's better, the traffic is increasing, the trash is increasing. We do have a transitional workforce. So, you know, there's, there's constantly people that we're having to train to pick up the scope of work, but, uh, that's, you know, we do it to the best of our ability. If you call in anything, we're gonna come respond to you. We're gonna assess the situation and we're gonna take care of it to the best of our ability. Uh, we pressure wash sidewalks, that's in our contract. Uh, we don't, we, uh, when there's feces or, or any kind of biohazard, uh, we try to get it up to the best of our abilities. Uh, when it comes to homeless encampments, there's no such thing as a 100 foot level of restriction in some of our more hardened and well saturated areas such as Third Street. We do not let our sweepers, individual sweepers who are out there on their own and untrained in how to deal with that type of situation go onto those areas for their safety and just for efficiency. Me, my lead, driver's assistance in the truck will go take care of those areas that need that harder, you know, more intense work. Uh, that's basically, you know, uh, everything is increasing, but as I say, uh, the pressure washing, uh, we're close to the point where we can say 100% uh, of the district has at some time or another been pressure washed. But as we're, as we're learning all of this, we're realizing there are some areas that need it a little bit more regular, so we make sure we get a little bit more regular. It's just a matter of planning. We've been here a year. I think we're getting it all dialed in. Me, myself, with, you know, my expectations are higher than, than a lot of people's. You know, I always see room for improvement, but I have to work with the resources that I have and I have to take the time to train people, you know, to bring up, you know, the level of work that they're doing. And as always, call. Uh, we don't know sometimes if there's a specific issue, a specific concern, whether it's a good concern or a bad concern, unless you call. You can call, we'll come out, we'll talk to you, we'll figure it out, we'll get it done. And that's all I can say. I enjoy working with the bid. I enjoy working in Venice. Everybody, you know, that I have contact with, from Emily and them with the artists, from the farmer's market lot to you know, they're very appreciative. We have been spending a lot more time making sure that lot 731 and lot 701 and the adjacent area is as clean as possible. We have a huge volume of our tourists and a huge volume of residents that frequent that farmer's market and transit that area on foot. And, you know, we want to leave them, we want to give them a good impression of Venice when they show up and we want to leave them with a good impression of Venice when they leave. 
And with that, I can, you know, all I can say is thank you. I'm always available. I will always answer any question. I will always respond, you know, and when we're here, when the clean team is here, you know, it's not our time. It's your time that we're working on. So thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Explain to the board and the public the sort of special, you call it the Big Bertha or Big the, that okay. that pressure washing device. Have, what you're doing with that? We have a big pressure washer. First of all, I'm limited on my small uh, truck to 75 or 80 gallons of water. It's a very limited amount of space. We fill it up with a water hose, so it's a it's a half hour process, turnaround process sometimes for me to go pressure wash an area and then refill to pressure wash more. We, I don't, we don't use chemicals and I don't have heat on my truck. There are some areas that the heat, that the, that the dirt, the grime, the oil, just everything is just highly ingrained into the, into the concrete. When we bring the big chrysalis pressure washer, they have an extra thousand PSI and they have a, a propane burner or a diesel burner on it that heats up to a couple hundred, if not 300 degrees. And they're able to come and get what is, you know, what we consider a deep clean, which is pretty much can take the concrete back down to the way it looked, you know, when it was poured, if we take that time. There's areas such as Windward, there's areas, uh, our storefronts of our business owners uh, along Oceanfront Walk where it's, it's just dirty, it's just stained. Uh, I pressure wash regularly. We're going to have the, them come down, do the good pressure washing. I'll be in support of them. I've already been, you know, in contact. I have a, 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 a working understanding with Parks and Recs. I know where to direct the water to where it's not going anywhere, you know, that causes any damage to any watershed. We have areas like Hampton and Rose that are extremely, for anybody that knows it, extremely filthy. But I've done the research with the environmental response units. They put down a solution on Fridays that's legally considered something that kills and, and sanitizes all germs that are on the sidewalk. So if we bring the big pressure washer, it'll be in conjunction on a Friday where after the city and environmental response and the, and the, and the sanitation goes down the street, clears the trash, sprays the antiseptic and the sanitizing solution down, then we can pressure wash. So the only thing that'll be going into the drains is the same thing that'll happen if it rains. There won't be any kind of E. coli or bacteria or anything. Thank you for explaining that, because I just wanted to, because I know Rick Sumo brought that up, yeah. and John, you just brought it up again, and Eleni and Paul have been working closely with LA Sanitation to do everything they can to make sure that water is either not sent into the storm drains or is sent into the storm drains with the treatment that LA Sanitation recommends, which is pretty much all that we can do at this point. Because that vacuum thing that Rick Swinger talked about doesn't really work in these situations, so that's the route they've gone, but it's not been ignored. That's what I wanted you guys to know. That you don't think that stuff goes down the sewer walk, out into the ocean? What I'm, what I'm saying is... It's treated. It's treated. Legally, legally, when they come over and they they sanitize because of the recent hepatitis, just because of the regulations, the solution that they spray down on Friday environmental cleanups is a neutralizer, is a sanitizer. What about the, the uh, campers? That's, they're not there. You know, what about their donors? That's the same thing. They're cleaning that street, they're spraying that, that solution over that entire area. That's what they do on Fridays. What about the rats? Uh, I... Since Bonnie doesn't want to put in pieces of okay. uh, John, 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 listen, let the people order here. Well, this is you. what you should okay. be discussing. Next, yeah. next, uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Bob. And we appreciate all your efforts. Thank you for and, all and thank you for, uh, for all your leadership do and guidance to the people in the field. And thank well, them on our behalf. And, 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 John, I just want to add one thing, which is we now have, and there's been turnover, but at any given time, the clean team is employing 14 people that would not otherwise have jobs, and they have graduated 
Yeah, what, 10 or, so I mean, it's not even just a steady 14, there's a constant progression of people. And as Paul said, we brought people in who have been homeless in Venice. And it's, you know, that that's one of the things that I feel the best about is that that is a, that's an impact that continues to grow as these guys are out there. And the safe team plays a part in that as well, so anyway. Yeah, I know I'm not probably supposed to be talking right now. I'm sorry. <laughs> I want to add that, yeah, I think it's great how uh, it's infectious that homeless people uh, who end up in the bid, other homeless people see them and they get the <coughs> idea, hey, I can help myself too, either through Chrysalis or some other way. Um, and I also wanted to just bring up that I, I think both teams are getting more efficient as we go. Um, and, and really able to do their jobs to a higher level. So it's just wonderful. Thank you. Thank you both. One last thing. I just want to mention that you, since our last meeting, um, the clean team also did a lot of work, especially in our alleys where we have this issue. But um, once the rain subsided, our clean team also did a tremendous amount of work, um, seasonal weeding um, and removing of growth, um, which yeah. in our area is particularly prevalent in some of our alleys. Um, so we have some folks on staff who are who just really took that personally and got out there and cleared that stuff as soon as the rains died down. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And I also want to welcome Trevor Kale from Chrysalis. Uh, thanks. It's good to see you. And thank you for coming thanks for having me. Uh, okay, next is item four C, the bid CEO report. Thank you. Um, I'm going to keep it short today. I think we'll have a little bit more of a discussion um, on our other agenda items today. Um, but I'll respond to um, some things raised during public comment. Um, I want to thank you for coming, Melissa. Um, and we're very excited to see um, the Plaza realized. Um, at this point, um, the bid is a little over a year old. At this point, um, the board's current process um, for projects and developments is really simply to allow um, a forum for people to present them and for individual board members to take a position on those if they wish in their individual capacity and likewise the audience, etc. We haven't instituted as a board a process to weigh in on development or other projects. I don't I think part of that is um, the way this particular bid was formed. Our focus really is heavily on clean and safe. Um, so other than some things that are, are really directly impactful to public safety or public cleanliness of the district to date, we haven't really created a process to take um, positions on those. Um, but I know, I, I believe that you probably have a lot of support in this room and there are a lot of folks who might be able to, to do that. Um, in regards to funds, that's a tough one for us. We are way more restricted than a typical organization or a typical nonprofit because of the manner um, in which our funds come to us, their assessments on private properties. Um, we can only spend funds on highly restricted things. They have to be accounted for our management district plan and they have to fit within one of those buckets. Um, so we are unfortunately, we're not a great funding partner <laughs> um, for other things and that is really because um, our money is um, supposed to what is called specially benefit each of the parcels in our district. Um, um, however, um, the bid certainly does maintain that area. Um, I think one question I would have for you just um, that would be helpful probably to our staff to understand is um, um, we are interested um, when these clauses, because I, I know I'm familiar with some other ones in other parts of the city, um, when they roll out, I do know that um, when they're used well, um, they will generate a bit more trash. Is there any plan to put any additional trash cans out there, or are the businesses planning to offer any additional trash? Um, so, um, I'm going to have a meeting with all the businesses, just to, like mm -hmm. go over their responsibilities of like helping us store the furniture at night. Okay. And right now, like we, they manage their own trash system mm -hmm. at every single stall. So I sort of want to put that to them because I haven't seen trash be a problem now. So I don't also want to create a problem for them or mm -hmm. for us that doesn't currently exist. 
So um, I think more than anything, this is just gonna bring like uniformity to the street um, and not have it be something that currently is like illegal that they can be threatened to be ticketed. They're also aware that this isn't just like dedicated dining, like it's a community space that anybody can sit right. at. So I don't wanna like push them to do trash reciprocals if it's gonna cause a problem that doesn't exist because they all manage their trash right now and I, I don't see an issue with trash right now. Um, so I don't want it to be something that costs us more time and money or them. Um, if it becomes a problem, then I think we can like quickly pivot on that and add more uniform trash cans, but I don't want to force them to do it and then have it be a problem right now. I think what I have seen with other plazas of this type, um, because as you said, they're open to the public, people will bring food from other areas um, and from fast casual restaurants. And so, yes, the person who purchases from that business in that stretch might take their trash back inside to that restaurant, but it would be helpful to have some type of a trash receptacle out there. Um, unfortunately, a lot of people, if there's not an obvious place to throw away their trash, they will eat it, and we've got windy situation and that sort of thing. So I, I think it would be helpful. This is my personal feedback based on other clauses that are anywhere near food-related businesses, that having, um, we can certainly help empty that trash receptacle, but having a trash receptacle that is highly visible would go a long way towards people not leaving things on a table or not leaving them on the curb. Yeah. Um, I think that will help because I think you will have more people come in there to sit down and eat briefly, like people who may pick up food on the boardwalk or things like that, who are like, I'd like a place to sit down rather than hold this needless. Yeah, I think that's um, good feedback. That, help. that I think that would help a yeah. lot and that will help us in maintaining because we, um, that's on a, on a sweeper route, mm -hmm. but there will be a big gap between the morning and the afternoon sweeper route. So there's plenty of time for that trash to accumulate or blow around or that sort of thing as well. There's a bunch of dumpsters on the corner of Speedway, so I'm actually more concerned about those dumpsters because those dumpsters seem to be constantly full and overflowing. So um, I'll talk to the vendors because I'm planning to have a meeting and I'm ha open to, especially if you guys would support us in emptying them and if they're open, to, I mean, they're already on board to help maintain and keep all the tables clean. And like I said, they all have their own trash management system now, but I'll get back to you on that. And okay. just like, you know, making sure that what the schedule is for trash pickup of the dumpsters and that that's being managed properly. But yeah, back to the letter, I would just, we, I just would love, because you guys didn't exist when we started, I had to present a budget of like what we were gonna do. So just, it's not even taking a position, it's more just like the business has come into play, this is what we do, this is part of what property owners pay to do, mm -hmm. and we do this on this street. So it doesn't even have to be a position, just <coughs> stating like what you guys do would be I what I need. I think perhaps the way to balance this, because we, we as a board can't act on this item today. We can't take a vote or a position on yes. this. Um, but what I think we can reasonably do, if you can give me a contact for DO, DOT or a contact for this project, mm -hmm. I can certainly introduce myself and explain what we do. So yeah. I can certainly, I can do something like that. Yeah. So that they understand that there's an additional resource in the community that will be caring for this space. Yeah, so even if there's like a link on the website, I don't know that says this is part of your route. I just mm -hmm. want to show them that we have support that didn't exist currently that's funded by the property owners. On sure, the we do have right on our homepage, um, there is a map of our district that you can click on. You can download it as a PDF as well. And it shows uh, the area that we service and obviously <coughs> this is within it. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you for coming today. Yeah. Um, uh, thank you to Emily and Suzanne, who have been partners on a number of is art-related issues in the community. Thank you for coming today. Um, we're glad to see um, one of our most iconic murals uh, being restored, um, and we look forward to partnering and working together with you to get other owners into the program and get more of our murals coded. Um, John, um, on CPRA records, um, we do have requests that precede yours that we are still working on. Um, one of those is quite voluminous, um, but I do expect to get you at least some of the records um, this month. Um, I don't know when the request will be complete, but at that time I'll try to give you an, an estimate. Um, the payment to DBA, um, for those of you who, I believe you know this, John, because this has been discussed at other meetings, but for those of you who are not familiar with this, 
Um, the Dennis Boardwalk Association is the association that originally um, undertook the bid formation. Um, that organization had um, a number of roles in this community, um, but one of the things they did was they uh, put together money, uh, seed money, in order to form the Business Improvement District. Had the Business Improvement District not been formed, that organization would never have recouped any of those costs. Um, however, in the city of Los Angeles, when you form a business improvement district, if it is successfully formed, one of the eligible expenses of the business improvement district is to reimburse those formation costs. So that is what that payment is. Um, I'll address some of uh, your comments on the power washing, et cetera, and the distance from encampments. Um, in regards to the gentleman uh, whose name I do not have from the people of California, um, in regards to bylaws and board elections, um, our bylaws, uh, I, I think, may have been misread, but if you read them again, you'll find that um, our, our board of directors um, will uh, change, or a portion of our board will change, at our second annual meeting, which would be this December. So that has not yet occurred. Um, there is no violation of the bylaws. Um, in regards to RSO, that is not really an issue that is before the board. That is an issue external to this organization. Um, so um, that would be a private discussion with individuals involved in those. Um, on tagging, the only thing I would add, I think it was handled ably um, here. I will say, based on my past involvement in trying to get the city to prosecute tagging cases, um, there are um, two things that are really important. Actually filing a police report, um, and if you are able to do so safely, and I never recommend that someone put themselves in physical danger to obtain evidence, but um, any sort of photography or filming of that act, or if you have access to any video footage or still photography of that, it is very difficult. I've, I've had many things sent to me as well where you can't see a face of a person or anything identifying. That's a challenge. Um, so the clearer the photograph, um, the more it is able to be a person is able to be recognized or identified. That is really helpful. Um, and in general, um, many of these cases do really require um, evidence of a pattern of behavior. Um, successful graffiti prosecutions have largely been against people who are repeat offenders within a community. Um, and thankfully, there have been people who have documented at least two or more instances of that tagging. Um, so those are tough cases. Um, they are largely uh, city LA misdemeanor city attorney cases. Um, and it's paperwork matters. Um, without the paperwork, unfortunately, most of these taggers, even if they're photographed, even if they're caught by someone in the act, reported, etc., most of these do not turn into prosecution. So documentation, willingness to file that police report, those are really what will get um, those chronic taggers off of. Um, Carl, may I add something to that? When sure. I made my police report, I put a tag on a mural. Mm -hmm. Residents had taken pictures of the tagger. They could not get a full face. But I called 310 and I got the runaround. I went down to the police station and at first I got the runaround. But the police came through, they made a report. I didn't even know what the number was until I went down there with more pictures. And um, so it's very hard to get through on, on reporting the tagging. So I don't know if there's something you can do about that to have a number specifically for tagging instead of the general I think number. What I heard Taylor one. say is that those calls should not go to 311, but they should go to either 911 if it's, if it's occurring in process. In other words, not after the fact, but if it's, it's actively occurring in process, then a call to, and this is more likely to result in a police report and a prosecution if it's caught in process, or it's a bit easier. Um, that you should be, that uh, somebody who's seeing it in process should call 911 or the LAPD emergency line. In other words, treat this as an active crime in process the same way you would treat a property crime. If somebody is um, stealing your alarm system or ripping copper pipe out of your building, that, that um, vandalism to our art murals and things like that should be treated in the same way as, other, as we treat other <coughs> property crimes. Um, and that it shouldn't be considered a non-emergency issue. It should be considered a crime in process. 
Is that accurate, Taylor? Right. Uh, so Emily's point, I think, is also if it's, if it's not a crime in progress, uh, the difficulty that does honestly come from needing to go to the station, it, you're going to need to probably go to, if it's not in progress, you're probably going to need to go to the station to file go in person. Uh, in person. And what we found through Emily's case, uh, I think my memory is correct, is we needed the property owner to say that they were, or did they end, end up, did they end up accepting your, uh, you as the? Well, they, they felt that property owners should make a complaint. Yeah. And then um, I said, well, there was a manager I, I wrote to uh, uh, Jeremy, and he uh, complied. He said, yes, go ahead. Uh, but there's a lot of complications, and you do have to go in person. Um, I, I would just say that there must be some way to make it easier if you really want to curtail the tagging. I wonder, Tim, well, one, one tip I can offer people having spent some time at Pacific Division is do not go in the afternoon. They are slammed all the time, every day of the week. Things happen, and I would my ex, my general experience is that lunchtime to five or six p.m. you are going to wait for a while to be able to file a report or speak to an officer. So I highly recommend if it is not an emergency, try to go early in the morning or later in the evening. You'll spend a lot less time there trying to achieve the same thing. That's just one tip. The police gave me um, three numbers to call with that call. I couldn't get through. I wonder, Taylor, is is perhaps something we could explore is, is there any legal alternative way for someone, for something like graffiti specifically, to write some type of statement that could be considered, I don't know if that's a possibility, but it might be worth asking. Because um, I think some people would be willing to sit down and write something down, you know, and sign it but might not be willing to go down and spend an unknown amount of time in Pacific Division. I have to see if that's how police reports are taken. I mean, this is this is property crime, so it's, it's, it's not legally not really that different from any other property crime. If you broke a window or you, or you I don't know, whatever you can do to some of the property. But um, it, if, if people are having difficulty submitting that police report, as Emily did, um, I, I do want to be made aware of that because uh, LAPD is not super familiar with people actually submitting police reports to this. So in her case, we actually got the captain involved, and I have to give uh, Captain Setzer a lot of credit because he he really made sure that uh, his officers uh, responded quickly to her and um, kind of figured it out. Um, but that sort of um, education on how the urgency that we want to treat these cases with uh, needs to really be kind of reinforced, I think, uh, by more police reports and, and potentially more involvement from my office and, and the captain personally on, 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 on setting that urgency for officers. Can I make a quick comment? Because I did some research in this because I was trying to figure it out on my own. There's an app called My LA 311 so if it's after the fact and it's already happened as a crime, you don't have to be app savvy, Emily, but and it's, you know, I looked at it and it was pretty involved, so I didn't do the deep dive yet, but I don't know if that helps solve that, the after the fact. I love the app. Is it, um, yeah, it's okay. good for reporting, you know, if there's graffiti, the city will come out on a specific, specific day and remove the graffiti. Yeah. Or if there's trash on the street, they'll remove it. But it's, the, not that's, a it's not a, that is not yeah, a law, not, law, not law enforcement thing. Yeah. But that's for getting it removed. But for Emily's situation, on the endangered species mural, we weren't looking for someone to come out and, and and repaint I the see. wall. Oh, it, it came out in the past, and uh, but I had a large graffiti <coughs> on it, and um, it didn't work out very well. <laughs> but one, <laughs> one thing when they power washed it off, it has a very sturdy varnish on it at that time. So they, they washed off the water with pieces of paint floating down in the boardwalk. So uh, Suzanne found out that we had a friend who had a, pot, a wet bath, and we had to vacuum all that up. So it wouldn't be running, environmentally running out onto the boardwalk. And then we had to figure out what to do with that. So um, that's why the city can't do the mural. No. <laughs> yeah. I wish they could. But <laughs> we have a contract for Pacific Graffiti Solutions. That's the contractor that does it. So it's not actually city employees, but it's one, one, one um, it's, it's basically all the same. They're not good for murals, at least for right. So for murals, 311 is not necessarily the place to get. They have like a city palette that they're, they're effective at
covering graffiti with that they're good at that, but um, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't have them respond to murals. Huh. Are we are we I'm, moving on to the next thing? Because if, yeah, before well, we do, I want to, then, on graffiti or? No, not on graffiti. Okay, then I, I just want to ask you a question if I could mm -hmm. before Melissa leaves. You know, if she reached out to you with an email saying, what services do you provide on this section mm -hmm. of the street? You'd be able to, without an act of the border, yeah. you'd be able to respond and direct her with a link maybe to the website or something. Yeah, there's a, there's a very clear link on our website for our claims and kids and kind of what we do. So and would that yeah. be what you're looking I mean, for? Would just, anything that could make it like official, <clears throat> so kind of coming from someone besides me would just be helpful. So if you want me to write that email, yeah. just, even if you just respond with the link and say, our, our one other comment is yeah. we, we are term limited, so one of the things we always have to be cognizant of is that we can't make any commitments that exceed the current big term. Uh -huh. So we're currently through the end of 2021. Great. So that's our maximum. Taylor, why does Melissa have to jump through so many hoops? Uh, yeah, I've been I've been right there at the trenches yeah. with her. It's mostly awesome. Fire, who is yeah. uh, oh. their hydrant access unit, or the, like the, the people that make they don't want anything in the public right of way because it theoretically could stop one of their engines, and that has been like 90% of the hurdle, right? Yep. And 95% of the hurdles is getting fire to sign off, because they want they want enough room to be able to get one of their big trucks through, and then some, um, which I think is a little silly. And those things are meant to smash through cars, they can smash through tables and chairs, uh, but that negotiation has been the difficulty, but we've gotten over that, right? Yeah, everything's yeah. done. This is really just to show that we have additional um, backup in a worst case scenario. So it doesn't just fall only on the property owners and businesses. But I don't anticipate there being any change or any drastic difference in how we've operated with or without you guys in the past. So what's the closing date on that's for service and speedway and Pacific. Between Speedway and Ocean Park. Excuse me, sorry, Speedway and Ocean Park. Yeah. No, sorry, I, I misspoke. Yeah, I, 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 I just, yeah. No, it's just the stuff. Yeah. 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 yeah, I'll email you then. Thank you guys so much. Thank, Thank you. you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. The online portal is still not great, though. I yeah, yeah I have its quirks. <laughs> she's correct, and not not. Uh, but you know, if if, if we're talking about mural one that we really want to make yeah. sure we're going after, please go into the station. But it's, that's not. But correct. that's not on the three one one app, or that is on the three one one. No, it's now it's on the website. website. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, I also just I don't. I think we have any representatives today, but I also want to say that one of our, our great partners in Venice Beach um, that really helps us do a lot of what we do, and it's it's a very informal relationship, but we, we really talk all the time. Both our clean and safe teams talk a great deal with Rec and Parks. Rec and Parks has a really huge role in our particular community, and um, we just, we have wonderful cooperation there. We've been helpful to them in helping to get um, stickers off a lot of their signs that regulate behavior that people then don't see, don't read, and don't pay attention to. Um, we recently helped them as part of the vendor painting process. There was an area where there was boots and it would have taken them a lot longer to be able to get that up. We were able to pressure wash it out so that they could correct it. So we. And from our, from our perspective, you know, we're very limited on dumpster space, so bulky items we remove on a case-by-case -case basis, and whatever we can't remove, we either 311 request, or sometimes we can work with Brecken Parks. Brecken Parks, if they have room in one of their um, uh, bins or that, also help us get some of our bulky items out of the district. So um, Bob and his staff are just really great to work with. Um, he's got great people in the field and on the ground, and our teams really, um, value their relationships there and just talk all the time and help and that kind of cooperation at really you know the field level is one of the things that helps us keep the district cleaner and safer for everybody so big thanks to Rec and Parks and United <laughs> and that's all I've got for today all right Kara thank you very much and on behalf of the board uh, I want to thank you for always going above and beyond and I think I think we can
say that. Okay, we're going to move on to item five, the consent items, and I understand item five a, the approval of the minutes. Uh, we'll continue to the we'll, next. We're meeting. going to continue to um, the next meeting, so we're going to move to item five b, the financial reports. Uh, welcome, Mr. Lieber. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Today I'll provide a brief summary of year-to-date finances to May 31st. A review of the balance sheet at 531.19 shows cash on hand of approximately $1.176 million. Current year outstanding assessments total $567,000. Prior year assessments of $65,000 remain outstanding. This represents 2017 and 2018 assessments not collected or dispersed by the city at this point in time. Accrued expenses of about $674,000. This, I think it's actually 60, excuse me, I may have made a mistake. Accrued expenses of 74,000, excuse me. Uh, this is figures comprised primarily of accrued clean and safe services for May, there were not invoiced to the bid by the end of the month. Highlights from the May income statement with a focus on year-to-date income and expenses. Income, through May of this year, the bid has revenues, total revenues of 1.39 million. The majority of the revenue, of course, is from assessments, but it also includes interest and penalty income imposed and collected by the city of LA on delinquent assessments. As for expenses, admin is under budget because of no use of contingency reserves that were budgeted for in 2019, no salaries due to a vacant position at the bid, legal expenses are under budget, and financial review and tax services not yet provided or billed. <coughs> clean and safe expenditures are under budget as well due to clean and safe service fees being under budget. And as with the admin category, there are no salary expense or use of contingency reserves to date. Under district identity and special projects, it is under budget because of, once again, no salaries, no expenditures for the enhanced data capture and reporting, and no use of reserves. I'd like to point out one note, the BIDS 2018 financial review has been performed by an outside third party. The report is currently being finalized and will be presented at the next board meeting. In summary, overall the BID is operating in a very good fiscally responsible manner and expenditures are under budget through the first five months of the year. That completes my report for today. Thank you for your time and have a great rest of your day. <laughs> Does the board have any questions or discussion? Some some of this will come up a little bit in our next um, next agenda item on um, uh, assessments. But are there any specific questions on what Marcus has presented at this point? I mean, I think I would add that um, everything seems very under budget. But part of the reason is that our budget includes our surplus. Mm -hmm. and our surplus needs to last us more than just through this budget year. Mm -hmm. It needs to be spread out throughout our remaining lifetime. So mm -hmm. those, all of those under budget numbers that sounded so promising um, are not, uh, you, it's not the best way to look at it. It's not an accurate way to look at it, let me put it that way. Um, in addition, you know, um, some of the clean and safe services are under budget at this point in the year because we ramp up to summer. Um, mm -hmm. So we have a kind of curve that is at its height in the summer and at the low during the winter. Um, those are my only other comments. And I just want to add that um, Tara and the clean and safe team, all of them, were very diligent during the rainy season at cutting hours when people were not needed in the fields so that there would be, I think these guys are very, very good at looking for every way to be frugal. So um, I, Some of those savings are what are allowing us to do the special 
you know, Big Bertha pressure washing unit, the hot water pressure unit from downtown, um, we're using some of those rainy day savings um, uh, to uh, pay for those projects. Um, and that was thanks to Eleni. Um, Eleni and I worked together during our rainy season and we would just look at the forecast day or two out and if there was 80% chance of rain for a substantial part of the day, we know we can't put sleepers out in the pouring rain. Um, so we took voluntary call offs or in a few instances cut some shifts um, and were able to save some money um, and deploy that elsewhere to clean the district on sunnier days. So. Thank you, El so thank you, Ellen. Yeah. Thank you. Yes. Any other questions or comments from the board before we have a roll call vote to adopt the financial report? Anything else? Okay, so but Matt, a quick question. Um, what is the organization's approach to um, inquiring about past due assessments? What's the, how do we, how do we approach that? Um, so I would say um, in comparison to other bids um, and in comparison to um, my length of history with um, bid assessments, um, we enjoy a very strong collection rate. We are not seeing a high level of delinquencies. Most of the delinquencies that we do have, um, we know some of the reasons for them. Um, properties often tend to become delinquent when a property owner is in financial distress, when a property goes into probate, um, when there's a major change to the parcel, sometimes there are delays, change in ownership, sometimes you know the bills get paid more slowly, um, individual financial hardship, you know, some people pay their bill entirely up front in the fall, some people stretch it out, um, uh, and then some are just timing issues. So for example, government entities vary, but they generally pay, but they often pay late, so just because bureaucracy and the processing of, of payments, so sometimes, and those are also manual bills because government agencies don't pay property taxes. Um, their assessments are manually billed, so that also can contribute to those coming in a bit slower. Um, that's why bids, historically, um, we budget a substantial amount for contingency on people with slow pay, delinquent assessments. Um, but I will say this, in general, um, most bids, simply because of the size of our resources, et cetera, we don't generally chase down assessments like bill collectors, with notable exceptions. Um, if we have you know, significant properties or a significant um, amount of delinquency, the vast majority of delinquencies will sort themselves out in a reasonable period of time. Um, because our assessments are part of the property taxes, we are also part of the assessor trying to get their money. So. Um, if the assessor places a lien on the property, those taxes need to come in faster usually. Um, so for the most part, we don't have to chase those. For the most part, I would say it is my expectation that we do not, we, we will not have until economic circumstances in the broader economy change. I don't anticipate um, a level of delinquency such that we usually need to be proactive at it. Now that said, Marcus and I do keep an eye on those reports. If we notice a substantial pattern of delinquency, then we might um, uh, try to investigate that or look into that. Um, and if a property is substantially delinquent for a substantial period of time, um, we could, um, we, we could as a remedy, we could um, provide notice to that person that we are going to seek their services until the person is paid. So those are all possibilities, um, but yeah, most goods do not get into the bill collection business unless you have really substantial delinquencies that are affecting your bottom line. But we are more than adequately budgeted to withstand, um, really what we see more of is slow pay.